I'm Jen Taylor Skinner, and this is The Electorate. On this episode, I had the absolute pleasure of speaking with Virginia Case Solomon, the CEO of the League of Women Voters, a 102-year-old voting rights organization that's dedicated to empowering everyone to fully participate in our democracy. Virginia joins me to discuss Women's Equality Day, which is observed on August 26 to commemorate the 1920 adoption of the 19th Amendment. This is a frank conversation. We talk about everything from the misguided romanticization of the women's suffrage movement. We talk about affirmative action, the Dobbs decision, and what we can all do to avoid the mistakes of the past while making sure that as we move forward in our fight for equality, that we bring everyone along and not just a privileged few. So without further ado, please enjoy this conversation with the CEO of the League of Women Voters, Virginia Case Solomon. Hey, Virginia Case Solomon, welcome. Thank you. Great to be here. It is Women's Equality Day, which is the day in which we commemorate the adoption of the 19th Amendment, which granted women, of course, the right to vote. But of course, we know that the 19th Amendment did not benefit all women equally. Women of color, Black women, Indigenous women, Asian American women didn't have access, equal access to the ballot box for a while and, you know, for various reasons. And I know that you wrote an op-ed about this in 2019. I think that was the 99th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. And in that op-ed, you said that we romanticized the women's suffrage movement and the passage of the 19th Amendment. How so? How has it been romanticized? And how has that view of this this period in our history been harmful? Yeah, you know, it's really interesting because as we were getting ready to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, if you look back in history books, you see there is a very limited amount of any information really about what happened during that time frame. So little girls growing up looking at that, they would see these women holding, you know, a flags or whatever, walking in a procession in their white dresses. And you think, oh, they did a march and they got the right to vote. (laughs) And it's just, there's such, it's such a little known part of our history for women today. And they just made it seem like it was just given, like it was this gift and it wasn't this hard battle. And the reality is that it took more than 70 years, more than 70 years for women to be able to win that right. Much like the ERA today, it's been going on for a really long time. And there were women who got arrested and protested, chained themselves to the White House fence, were force fed in prison because they were on a hunger strike. Black women who were instrumental very instrumental in that fight, whose stories are just mostly erased. And then the fact that Native American women weren't even considered full citizens in this country until 1924. So when we look at the stories of history, it tells just very little about what really happened and how long that fight went on for. And so we felt like it's time to be able to tell the real stories of women, women in the movement, and how the 19th Amendment was really passed. Right. So the fight took a really long time. But, you know, it also happened a long time ago. It's been over a century since the passage of the 19th Amendment. And the thing that I think about most is that in this current election cycle, most people, most women who are making up the the current voting population, myself included, and people who will be voting in the upcoming presidential election, we all have fewer rights today than we were born with. I know me personally, you know, when I was born and throughout my entire life, Roe v. Wade has been intact. Just to give one example, you know, the Dobbs decision hadn't happened. Shelby County versus Holder hadn't happened. And, you know, that was the Supreme Court decision that gutted the Voting Rights Act. And I'm curious if you could name or roll back probably the most harmful event that's happened in, let's say, the past 10 years or the past 15 years that's been the most harmful in stripping away women's equality, what would that one thing be? If you could just snap your fingers. Absolutely. The Dobbs decision. Absolutely. 100 million percent. The Dobbs decision. I mean, when you look at how women reacted last year when that decision came down, it was for many, shock and horror. Uh, But I will say that it wasn't come to us as a surprise to many of us because we know that there has been a concerted effort on the extreme right to remove a woman's right to bodily autonomy. There has been a 50-year fight in place and it's coordinated. It's not just out of the religious right, but this is out of the Federalist Society. It's out of the courts. It has been a strategic endeavor to be able to make sure that women do not have that 
control over their bodies. And I think it is a tipping point for women in so many ways because we know that this is just the beginning. But it was a great achievement for people who have fought against abortion rights for them to be able to get that win. And it's time for us to reclaim our power back because otherwise we are on a slippery slope on a downward hill when it comes to women's rights. Yes. And you know, someone posted on social media today a map of all of the states where abortion has been either partially banned or completely banned. And it's growing, right? It's spreading across yep. the country. And it's actually pretty scary. And since we're talking about women's equality, all of these things work in tandem. Again, speaking about the Dobbs decision without full bodily autonomy, without being able to make basic medical decisions, because of course, abortion is healthcare, you know, without being able to control when and if we have a family, women overall will have a lower quality of life, right? Absolutely. Women will be poorer. More women will fall into poverty, will have worse health outcomes. You know, women will die because of this, right? Absolutely. Uh, you know, so, and I asked that question before because often during a presidential term, we may get two major pieces of paradigm shifting legislation, right? And so I just wanted to know, like as constituents and as people listening, you know, what we should focus on. But do you think that there is a single piece of legislation, something sweeping that could happen hopefully in the next presidential term or soon that would, you know, right the ship broadly for women in terms of equality? Well, I would say that I don't think that there is one magic pill. I think that just across the country, things that will right the ship for women, obviously the ERA is a big part of that. The Equal Rights Amendment will give rights or at least codify rights for women in this country. And we should have it already. Like, let's just be really clear. There is just, there is no reason why Congress uh, can't or should not pass the ERA now that we have the adequate number of states. And that timeline is very much arbitrary. And so it's something that I think is resolvable. But besides that, I think there is also an opportunity to have some sweeping health care legis legislation that would codify a woman's right to abortion. I also think when we think just very broadly about women's rights as a whole, we look at equal pay, for example, and we're supposed to, the Equal Pay Act is not, is it's not living up to. There's legislation that already exists that is not living up to its promise for women, much like the 19th Amendment did, right? When we think about the 19th Amendment, not all women were able to benefit from the 19th Amendment when it became legislation. It took the Voting Rights Act to be signed and an end to Jim Crow and a civil rights movement to happen for women to be able to access the ballot. And we still have challenges today because of all of the law anti-voter laws that we see happening in the country. Much like the Equal Pay Act, we see that women's equal pay day is different depending on who you are in this country, what race you were born in this country. So it's not just about sweeping legislation. It's about really fully realizing the promise that legislation for legislation that was already created and passed. Right. And, you know, and that's my fear, though. You know, you bring up a really good point about the Equal Pay Act. We always, whenever we have this legislation, there are people and women in particular in, who are already marginalized in other ways who are often left behind. And yeah. I don't really know how we can stop making those mistakes, you know, similarly to the way that we did with the 19th Amendment. What's what's the answer there? Well, I think there's a thing for us as women. And this is where I was having a conversation with somebody, another colleague, not that long ago. And we were talking about uh, how much of a role race and an economic status in this country, race and wealth, right, play in this country. And I think one of the challenges that we see for women today is that we try to, or at least predominantly white women, I want to be really clear, predominantly white women chose to go right to the healing part. When you think about truth, reconciliation, and healing, People avoided the truth and reconciliation piece. We saw this happen during the Reconstruction era, right? With just broadly in this country. We as Americans tend to want to go right to the healing part because it creates discomfort for us. It forces us to have conversations about what actually happened in the past. The original sin of slavery in this country, the original sin of discrimination in this country, bigotry, all of the things that many people have faced, those who are most left behind in this country. And I think there needs to be a moment where we are able to come together and really talk about what those, the impact that it has on us today. Because some people will say, 
we're all equal now. We all have equal protection under the law. We all have the same opportunities. And that conversation between equity and equality, many people avoid that conversation. You see this today with the book bans, right? Think about the book bans that are happening and think about how history is being taught in schools because some people are afraid that it's going to make kids feel bad. And I think what, for me, for example, it's not about teaching kids to feel bad. It's about teaching empathy. It's about being able to understand history. And I think as women, we need to be able to come together and have really difficult conversations around race and class in this country so we can understand, A, what the truth is, to be able to have reconciliation so that we can get to that place of healing and we can actually be unified as women. There are too many things dividing us today because those conversations have never happened. And that's one of the things at the league that we work really hard to do is to be able to have really difficult conversations across racial, cultural, and economic lines because we realize that we how much stronger we are together. So I think that's one of the things that we really need to focus on. Can you talk more about your congressional petition? What does that cover and what's in it? And what do we gain from from signing that petition? So our congressional petition focuses on three very specific areas. So we've kind of reclaimed Women's Equality Day as women's inequality, just based on the fact that (laughs) We're we're not equal right now. We are less equal than we were 50 years ago. Despite many significant advances, I'm not saying women haven't had pro- seen progress in this country, but there have also been these really, really terrible roadblocks. And so we're focusing on three areas. One is women's voting rights. Women have more barriers to voting than any other demographic in this country. We know that voting rights legislation undermines women's rights fully, point blank, period. And so we want to make sure that we are fighting for women's voting rights. The second is constitutional equality. Again, the ERA. It was introduced a hundred years ago. That's really hard to believe that a piece of legislation that was introduced originally a hundred years ago that has already met all of the ratification requirements is not published yet. So we want to make sure that the ERA is is published. And then the last piece is reproductive freedom. You know, the Dobbs decision really did a number on, on women and really overturning that constitutional right. And we want to fight for the rights of women to be able to have agency over their bodies and their healthcare decisions. And so this petition really is urging Congress to protect women's rights, to make sure that the ERA is added and that we restore reproductive freedoms for all women. Right. So can we talk about the ERA a little bit more? Because I just want to make sure everyone understands the history. So like you said, it's been 100 years since it was originally originally passed. And I think it was in 2020. So the requirement is that 38 states have to ratify the ERA and their constitution in order for it to be ratified on the federal level. And I think it was 2020, in 2020, that Virginia became the 38th state, the, the last required state, and still hasn't been ratified into the constitution. And the reason is why. Can you explain why that hasn't been ratified? Okay, so there are a few reasons why it's not ratified. But because there was a deadline that was initially put forward that in order to be able to ratify the ERA, all the states had to ratify within this very specific time frame. The last states ratified after that timeline. And so in order to be able to you know, fully realize this as, as a constitutional amendment requires that we're, that we're able, that Congress go back and basically get rid of that deadline. That's basically what it is. And so what we think is that it's really important for people to understand that we passed all of the requirements. We've passed all the requirements. It's not as though this is something that, you know, hasn't been worked on for nearly 100 years. We've been working on this for nearly 100 years. And it is something that there is something that Congress can do about it. And that timeline is just, it's an arbitrary timeline. The work has been done. And so now Congress needs to make sure that it becomes law. So Congress can lift the timeline, right? Yes. Is okay. It seems like a no-brainer that, you know, why would you not want to ratify the ERA? You know, we will see. 
Well, there um, is debate under some constitutional experts, right? But our opinion is that um, it it can be ratified. Okay. It was always decided that it was best left in the hands of Congress. Mm-hmm. So the Congress can waive that deadline. I want to make sure that there's just, it's very, very clear. Congress can waive that deadline. Okay. They can I'm sorry. Waive. I just wanted to make sure that I, I clarified that because, um, again, it's this arbitrary deadline and Congress can do something about it. And it's not something that needs to be left to the courts. It, yeah. it's, it's a political question that the courts have already decided is best left in the hands of Congress. Why have they not done it? Well, that's a really good question. And again, there is debate among Congress. I will tell you that the majority or many people in Congress believe that it can be. Ayanna Presley and Cori Bush are spearheading the ratification of the ERA, and they have support from many, many de- Democratic members of Congress and a few Republicans, but not enough to be able to get it over the finish line. And so if we can convince enough Republican legislators to agree to the ratification and removing that deadline, we will have an ERA. I just, I want to make that clear. It is totally in Congress's hands at this point to remove that terrible, awful deadline. We've already (laughs) met all of the requirements. And so it is in the hands of a few people to get us to the majority to be able to pass this and make it law. I feel like we aren't, more people aren't talking about this enough. I remember having an episode about this before Virginia ratified, you know, at their state level. And I think I was talking to Kate Kelly about this. And, you know, she was saying that, you know, but there is this one thing, there's this deadline. And I don't think that they'll pay attention to this arbitrary deadline, but they might. And that's the only thing we have to worry about. And of course it happened. And then if it feels like we just kind of stopped talking about it. And I think that's one of the things that it's important to have conversations like this and podcasts like yours who are talking to people and meeting people where they're at, right? Because a lot of women don't even realize it. And people think, There is an argument among some in Congress that say, well, we have the Equal Protection Clause, but that really, really, we've seen what's happened to women. It's not being applied appropriately. And the reality is that there is nothing in the Constitution that speaks to the equality of sexes. Nothing. And so for this this particular amendment, it is going to be changing, life-altering for women. And I think if more women knew and understood that they can push their legislators to have that deadline removed, I think we might even be there sooner. So you're absolutely right on one hand. And the other thing is we need to create a groundswell among women to demand that that deadline be removed. Again, Congress can absolutely do it. Yeah. I mean, I it's just hard to imagine that this wouldn't be, again, you know, I'm repeating myself, a no-brainer, right? There's no harm in ratifying the ERA at the federal level, but, you know. I no harm, about but that. it's not easy, right? I mean, a constitutional amendment is really, really hard. And that's why we haven't changed. We've only changed the Constitution a few times in this nation's history because it's really hard and politics gets involved. And the one thing, again, because the courts have declined to to make any decision around this. They say that it's a political matter that Congress needs to handle. So it's almost this hot potato item where everybody keeps tossing it around and nobody really wants to fully own it. Right, right. So let's talk a bit about affirmative action because that's another big, big thing that affects equality broadly. You know, that Supreme Court case came down, abolished affirmative action or abolished the ability for colleges to make admissions based on race just to put it simply, right? And it's one of those things, again, that I think that I think we understand. People think they understand what the repercussions of that are. But, you know, one of the conversations that was happening when this court case was happening is that white women benefited the most from affirmative action, right? And we've talked about that decision mostly in the context of race. But I think that it would be naive of us to not realize that at some point, women in college admissions are going to be affected by this, you know, women being admitted to college. Yeah, you know, I think that this is the thing about affirmative action. They said, well, we're just going to focus on this one piece of affirmative action around a college admissions. And I think that 
anybody who thinks just like the Dobbs decision or this around affirmative action, if you think that this is not part of a larger plan to chip away rights of individuals and to help create equal opportunity in this country, you're absolutely wrong. And I don't mean to sound bombastic or like a conspiracy theorist, but it's that we're fully realizing the impacts now of Dobbs a year later, right? I think a year or two from now, we're also going to see this around the college admissions process. And kudos to a lot of colleges who are trying to figure out workarounds, right? So maybe you can't take it into account on the college admissions application, but in your essay, you can talk freely about how your race and the challenges that you may have faced in your life would make you a better candidate for that school, right? We have to always find these workarounds for something that's already working. And I think uh, this case, again, going back to the Federalist Society and people who are engaged, who are funding some of these far-right extreme efforts, This goes back to the fact that there are some people in this country who see the shift that is happening in our country. They see how women are more educated, holding more professional positions. Black women are the most educated women, people in this country, right? right? There are people who are pushing back against all of these things. They look at the decline in birth rates. And instead of saying, we need to figure out why the middle class has shrunk so much and people can't afford to have children and why they're choosing to have children later in life or not at all. All, rather than, than, than do that, they're saying we need to force birth. So you think about there are just these extremes in our country that exist who have a lot of money, who are well financed and have a very intentional agenda. And so I don't think we can separate any of these things. And I think that's the important part around voting. And I connect all of these things back to voting and democracy. None of these things are disconnected. The same people who are fighting against abortion are the same people who are fighting against affirmative action. These are also the same people who brought up a court case to make sure that some people wouldn't have to create websites for LG. They created an imaginary person, right? Just to make sure that they wouldn't have to create a website for LGBTQ folks who are getting married. Think about that. And these are all coming from the same sources. And so the important thing that I think I would love everybody to take away from this is we talk about voting as if it's just about one singular election or the presidency. We are literally voting for our lives right now. And I want everybody to think about that, especially women. Vote for your life. Your life literally depends on it. And that of future generations literally depends on the vote right now. So I want to ask you, speaking of voting, (laughs) what can I do to supercharge my participation in this upcoming election cycle? Of course, I will cast my vote. I vote in the primaries. Of course, I'll vote in the general. What can I do beyond that? What can everyone, anyone who's listening, do to kind of supercharge their participation in the upcoming year? So there are quite a few things. Um, I will just say that today, this is the perfect day. Today is August 23rd that we are speaking. And today is Poll Worker Recruitment Day. We And so people can go to powerthepolls.org and they can sign up to be a poll worker. I think that's number one. We need to make sure that we have enough people who are working the polls. Because post-COVID and because of some of the election, the impact of elections and threats to, to election workers in the past, a lot of older people who used to work the polls are afraid to. And so we need people to step up because we need good people making sure that they're working elections. That's one. Number two is finding a political home for yourself. And it doesn't have to be a partisan one. It can be with organizations like the League where you can join in. We have more than 750 leagues throughout the country who are working on on election and voting issues all throughout the country, both at the local, state, and national level. So I would join, invite people to, to become a member of the League. We are engaged in a variety of different ways, whether it's get out the vote works, doing phone banks and text banks, reminding people of their voting locations, doing voter education, having candidate forums and debates. That's another way. But finding a political home for yourself where you can engage and making sure that other people are getting out to the vote. There are all kinds of opportunities to be able to do get out the vote work. And I think that's one one thing that's important. Making sure you're registered to vote, making sure that everybody in your family is registered to vote, and then creating a voting plan and making sure celebrating voting with your family members. 
going together, but any way that you can, you can engage in a variety of different ways. And those are just a few. Well, I actually did not know about Power of the Polls. It's at powerthepolls.org. Yes. And and there's it's it's really like today is a special day um, again, because it's like a big day where we're trying to get as many people to sign up to become election workers and they can continue to sign up to become election workers. Um that way. And you just go. And it's a really great day. Honestly, being able to work the polls is actually a really fun thing to do. And probably one of the best ways that you can exercise your citizenship in this country and really demonstrate your patriotism in a way that helps others. I think we need to reclaim what it looks like to be a patriot. And this is absolutely one of those ways. And it feels good. It feels good to help people. Sometimes you get to see people vote for the first time. And it's just like, it feels so good when you see young people who come in there with excitement and enthusiasm or older people who just have done it time and time again and, and being able to make sure that they have the supports they need to, to be able to exercise their, their civic duty. So yes, Power the Polls, the league is partners with them, and it's something that we're really excited about. We really are voting for our lives right now and that we want to make sure that everybody, I know there's a lot of apathy that has set in among voters and people are tired of the political climate, but this is the one way that we can make a decision about who is representing us. And I think oftentimes we think that power is concentrated just in Congress or with our elected officials, but we forget that we put them there. And we have the ability to remove them. We hire and fire the people who work for us at in government. And so being able to really own our power, don't feel, you know, like you don't have any power or control. We have the ability to make these changes. We have the ability to demand action from our legislators and they are accountable to us. And the more that they hear from us, the more likely they will to vote in the way that we want them to. And so just reminding that we have a lot of power together and that none of us are in in this on our own. And as women, I am like a girl's girl. I believe in the power (laughs) of women and I want women to be able to fully realize all of their potential in this country. And so I'm just really excited and would ask that people just be as excited and enthusiastic about this election. It is going to be a game changer if we really show up and show out for other women in this country. Yes, I I agree. Excited to see what we can do in this election cycle. Well, Virginia K. Solomon, thank you so much for joining me. I've truly enjoyed our conversation. You're welcome to come back anytime, but thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was great speaking to you. Thank you for having me.